This is the first lecture on section 1.2, finding Euler circuits. In the previous section, we learned about what Euler circuits are, why we want to find them for certain real-world problems, and we did some examples where sometimes we were able to find an Euler circuit and sometimes we weren't. So in this lecture, we're going to learn how to tell from the graph whether that graph has an Euler circuit or not. So here we have two graphs, and the graph on the left does not have an Euler circuit, but the graph on the right does have an Euler circuit. So we want to try to understand why. Why does the graph on the left not have an Euler circuit and the graph on the right does have an Euler circuit? So first of all, let's look at the one that does have an Euler circuit. I'm telling you, right, I'm saying the words this graph has an Euler circuit, but how would I convince you of that? How would I show you why this graph has an Euler circuit? Well, that's actually pretty easy because all I have to do is, is show it to you. I have to just illustrate the, the Euler circuit to you. So no, remember that for Euler circuits, we can start anywhere we want. Uh, I'll go ahead and start here at C, and I'll just start walking around. So I'll go from C to B. Now, if I'm writing down the Euler circuit, I'm just going to write the letters in order. So I start at C, and then I go to B, and then I'm going to go from B to A, and then I go from A to F. And now from F, I've got some choices, but I'll decide to go up to D here, and then from D to E, from E down to G, G, let's see, I'll go over to F again. Remember that for an Euler circuit, we are allowed to repeat the same vertex more than one time. From F, I'll go back to C. I've returned to my starting point, but I haven't hit all my edges yet, so I've got to keep going. From C, I'll go over to G. From G, I'll go down to H. And then from H, I'll go up to C. So that's an Euler circuit because I, t I walked along every edge exactly once and I returned to my starting point. And this list of vertices, that tells me how to do the Euler circuit. So if I erased all those arrows, but just give you that list of letters, you would be able to retrace my steps and recreate this Euler circuit. So what we're seeing is that when a graph does have an Euler circuit, it's pretty easy to demonstrate why, because all I have to do is show it to you. And in fact, that's just one of the many Euler circuits that this graph has. So just as a practice problem, you can pause the video and try to come up with your own Euler circuit for this graph. And again, you can start wherever you want. Now, why does a graph not have an Euler circuit, right? So again, we've answered the question of why the graph on the right has an Euler circuit, but why does the graph on the left not have an Euler circuit? So it turns out that the thing that we need to look at to understand why certain graphs do have Euler circuits and other graphs don't is degree. So when you have a graph, the degree of a vertex is the number of edges that meet at that vertex. And that turns out to be an important concept for the problem that we're asking about. So just as practice, let's look at this graph. And remember, this was the graph that doesn't have an Euler circuit. And let's look at the degree of each of these vertices. And I'm just going to do these in alphabetical order, but you can do them in whatever order you want. So let's look at A here. So A has two edges coming into it. So A the degree would be 2. So I'm just going to write the number 2 near that point that I've labeled A, just so that I can indicate what the degree is. B has three edges, 1, 2, 3, so I'm going to write the number 3. C also has three edges, 1, 2, 3. Let's see, next letter in the alphabet is D, so that's over here. I've got 1, 2, 3 again. E just has 1. F has 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Again, you don't have to sort of scribble along the edges as I'm doing. I'm just help, trying to help illustrate how I'm counting these. Next up in the alphabet is G. That's going to be a 2. And then H is also going to be a 2. So there I've counted the degree of each of the vertices of my graph. Now, one weird thing that happens here is that if I add up all of those numbers that I just found, if I add them all up, 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 and so on, add those all up, I get 20. And it turns out that 20 is exactly two times the number of edges in this graph. Let's verify that. Let's count the edges. So we've got one edge here. We've got two edges there. This is one edge from B to D, right? The fact that these two edges cross over each other, we don't have a vertex where they cross, right? They just uh, imagine you have like a road with an overpass, like a bridge going over the road. The roads don't actually cross there. So that's just a separate edge. And again, I'm just counting the edges here. So 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And 20 is 2 times 10. So why is that? Is that just a coincidence? Well, it turns out that's not a coincidence. We counted every edge twice. When we counted the degree of every vertex, this edge here that I've got the arrow pointing towards, we counted it once when we counted the degree of B, and we counted it again when we counted the degree of C. So each of those edges got counted twice. 
once at the one end point when we found the degree of that vertex, and once again when we counted the degree of the opposite vertex. So that's just a, a nice fact about degrees in a graph, is that the sum of all the degrees in the graph has to equal two times the total number of edges. And so if you're figuring out the degrees in your graph, that's a good way to check your answer, is to make sure that all the numbers you got, if you add them all up, you get two times the number of edges. Now, let's get back to the question of Euler circuits. You might actually be able to tell right away when we look at this graph that this graph cannot possibly have an Euler circuit. There's no way that we're gonna be able to pick a vertex walk up and down the edges of this graph, return to our starting point without retracing our steps. And the reason is because of E. E is sort of a bad vertex in this sense, because when we have a vertex with degree one, we can't have an Euler circuit. If we start there, if we start at E, then the very first move we have to make is to leave E and walk over to D. But if it's gonna be an Euler circuit, we're gonna have to come back to E at the end and the only way to come back to E is through D, which means we're going to have to retrace our steps and walk back along that vert, that edge in the opposite direction. Now, if we don't start at E, if we start somewhere else, well, eventually we still have to get to E, right? So if we start somewhere else in our graph and eventually we walk over to E, well, we didn't start at E, which means we've got to leave again and go back to our starting point. And that means we've got to retrace our steps again and go back the way we came. So there's no way that a, a, a graph that has a vertex with degree one, there's no way that that can have an Euler circuit. So that's one dead giveaway for this graph of why we don't have an Euler circuit. But it turns out the problem is not just degree one. Here's a different graph, similar looking to some of the other ones we have, but here's a different graph. And I've indicated the, deg the degrees of the vertices with those yellow numbers. And this graph also doesn't have an Euler circuit. And the problem is that some of the degrees are odd numbers. So for example, this vertex D here has degree five and five is odd. And it turns out that odd is gonna make it impossible for us to have an Euler circuit. So let's focus on this vertex D that has degree five and try to understand why the five being an odd number is a problem here. So just like we did with our uh, vertex of degree one, we've got to think about two different possibilities. What if we start at somewhere else in our graph and then what if we start at this vertex? So let's start by thinking about what if we started somewhere else? So somewhere else in our graph is our starting point. And we start walking along edges and we start walking along edges. And eventually we're walking along, let's say this edge that gets us to D. So we got to D, but now we have to leave because D is not our starting point. We can't possibly be done at this point. So we've got to pick one of these other edges and leave. And then we start wandering around our graph again and go around and around and around and who knows where we go. But eventually we've got to come back to D because there's three more edges that we haven't used. So we got to use one of these other edges to get to D. And then we have to use one of the other edges that we haven't used to leave again. And again, we wander around, we wander around. And eventually, again, we've got to come back to D because here there's one more edge that we haven't used. So eventually we're going to come back to D and now we're stuck. We're stuck because we walked into D, but we can't leave. So what I want you to notice is that every time we visited D, we used up two of its edges, right? One edge to get into D and one edge to get out of D. And since we started with degree five, every time we use two of those edges, the number of available edges goes down by two. We start with a five, goes down to three. We, now we have three. We visit again, it goes down to one. And if we only have one edge, just like with the example we saw earlier, if we only have one edge left over, we can't do it. If we walk into that vertex, we get stuck. Now, what if we start at D? What if D is our starting point? Well, the very first thing we have to do is leave that starting point. We've got to pick one of these edges and walk out along that edge. But again, the same problem. Once we start wandering around our graph, and eventually we've got to come back to D because there's edges we haven't used. So eventually we'll have to come back to D, and then we have to leave again. And then again, we wander around our graph, we're walking up and down edges, and eventually we have to come back to D. But now we've got one more edge we haven't used, which means we're not done with our Euler circuit. We've got to use all of the edges exactly once, which means we can't stay at D, we've got to leave. And the problem is now we've used up all of the edges that D had available, and we're not going to be able to get back to our starting point without retracing our steps. And again, the problem is that every time we visit a vertex, we use up two of its edges. And D having an odd number of edges means that this is just not gonna happen for our Euler circuit.
So that's what we've said. If a graph has any vertex with odd degree, then the graph does not have an Euler circuit. And the reverse is also true. This is called Euler's theorem. And the word theorem is sort of a fancy mathematical word that just means a true fact that we can prove. And the argument that I've given to you is sort of explain why the odd numbers are bad. That's kind of what we call a proof in mathematics, is me explaining to you why this principle always works, not just for the specific example that we were talking about, but for all examples. And so what the theorem says is that if a graph has all even degrees, if there are no odd degrees at all, then we do in fact have an Euler circuit. But if a graph has any vertices with odd degree, even one vertex with an odd degree, it's not going to be able to have an Euler circuit. So next time we're going to practice with this Euler's theorem. So we're going to look at practicing finding the degree of every vertex in a graph. We did one of those in this example, but we're going to do some more. And then we're also going to use Euler's theorem to determine whether or not that graph has an Euler circuit.